This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. We'll continue. So we're looking at examples of autonomous linear dynamical systems. This is not uh, basically systems of the form x dot is ax. Uh, you know, maybe zoom out a bit here so we can get the whole uh, page in there. There you go. Um, so we're looking at examples of autonomous linear dynamical systems, just systems that look like this. And it basically just says that the derivative of each um, component of the state is a linear function of the state itself. So here's a very, uh, a very standard model. It looks like this. Um, it's a reaction where uh, uh, some species, A, uh, converts or, or decays to species B, which in turn uh, decays into, into species uh, C. And this looks something like this. It's uh, x dot is uh, minus k1, uh, 0, 0. And we can actually work out what that means. This is basically x1 dot equals minus k1 x1. So here, x1 is the amount of species A present. And this says that basically it, the, the amount by which, the rate at which that decreases is proportional to the amount, something like that. So. So K1 is this reaction uh, constant here. The second one is actually very interesting, the second row. So as with looking at Y equals AX, you should never look at X dot equals AX and actually just kind of say, oh yeah, okay, that's fine. You need to actually understand exactly what everything is here. So the second row says X2 dot equals K1 X1 minus K2 X2. And how would you explain it? What is, what is that term? It's, what is it? Uh, minus x1 dot. This one is minus x1 dot. Um, but how, do you, how would you explain just in words? What, what is the meaning of this term? It's, it, this is a buildup of x2 coming from the decaying of x1. Or I, I should say it wrong. It's, it's a, it's a buildup of species B because that's a byproduct of the decay of species 1. And this. Is, the, is actually then the de, is actually the decay of x2, of uh, well or whatever it is. it's the decay of x2 because some of species B is turning into species C. And the final one is this, um, which is x3 dot equals k2 times x2, meaning that species C here only comes from the decay of species 2. That's this, and that's that, that's this bottom row. Okay. And what if I were to put something like this, minus k3? What would that mean? Where k3 is another positive constant. It would have a meaning. What would it mean? Yeah, x3 decays. And where does it go? Right, to vacuum. So to somewhere not on our, where we don't account for it, to the environment, somewhere else. Okay. Everybody see what I'm saying here? So we put a 0 here, and that's fine. Let's see, there's a couple of interesting things about this matrix. Oh, one is that the row, the column sums are zero here. So that has a meaning, actually. Um, I'll just mention that briefly. We'll go into this uh, in, later in, in much more uh, detail. But let's see what it means that the column sums are zero. We should restore that zero there, that the column sums are zero. Let's try one thing. Let's, what is the interpretation of one transpose x, x of t? Uh, 1 is the vector of all 1s, so what is 1 transpose x of t? It's the sum. It's the, so what is, how would you say this? It's the total amount of all species in your system, right? All right. What is this? What's ddt of 1 transpose x of t? Well, it's 1 transpose times x dot of t. x dot of t is dx dt, okay? Well, wait a minute. x dot of t is a x of t. Now. For this A here, the column sums are 0. What is this? In fact, more specifically, what is that? It's 0. For exactly because the column sums are 0. That's 0. What does all this mean? This says that the time derivative 
of the total amount of material in the system is zero. That, you know what that says? That says that one transpose x of t is actually equal to one transpose x of zero. It's constant. So you know what the column sum zero means in, a, in x dot equals ax? It's, it's, it's actually conservation of the sum, conservation of the total. Okay? So there's a name for systems like this. I'm just mentioning this because like, it's very important, as when you see y equals ax, to, not, to look at it, understand what every entry means, what every feature means. They all have meanings. In this case, the column sums are zero, corresponds precisely to conservation of mass or material, whatever you want to call it. Okay? So, that's just an aside. Well, let's see what happens here. Um, here's an example where we start with uh, one zero zero. So we start with one unit of species A. And you can actually, what happens here I think is kind of, uh, is, is obvious. By the way, you will very shortly know how to, how to actually work out what the solution of x dot equals ax is. But here what happens is, it's kind of obvious. Uh, x1 immediately starts decaying. Uh, in fact, what is the initial slope right here? If, the, if this is in, in t, at, at point zero 0.01, what is the amount of x1 present? What is it? Well, what's, what is x1 dot of 0? It's minus k1, okay? k1 is 1. So what is this initial slope here? It's minus, it's minus 1. So if I ask you, after, for example, 10 milliseconds, how much of, of, how much, how much of x1 has decayed, the answer is, point, uh, is point 0.01. That's how much. So at point 0.01, this thing is very, very close to 0.99 is the amount of is x1. It's not exactly 0.99, but it's, it's very close. Okay. That's the initial slope. Okay. Now what happens is this decays. By the way, as this one decays, x2 builds up. And in fact, if you were to add x1 and x2 together, you would get something that at first is almost constant. But it's not quite constant because x2 is further decaying into x3. So as x1 decays, that corresponds to x2 building up. Now by the way, as x2 uh, builds up here, here, once, it, once x2 is high, actually x1, this, you'd see that, that x1 slows down. Uh, here, or no, 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 sorry, it doesn't. I, what I just said was wrong, so scratch that. When we get the ability to edit the videos, that'll be, that'll be fun. So I can just like cut those things out, and I'll claim I never said them. Okay. All right, so x, x2 builds up, and x3 doesn't really start appearing because the only way you can get x species C, the only way x3 can go up, is for x2 to first build up and then a significant amount of x2 to decay. So if you kind of look at this, everything looks the same. Oh, and by the way, as you sweep along here and add x1, x2, and x3, what you'd find, of course, is that the sum is constant and it's 1. That's what we just worked out with conservation of mass here. Okay? So, I mean, this is a stupid little, pro you know, this is a stupid little problem. You could do this with undergraduate methods. It's not a big deal. Um, the important part, actually in all the things I'm looking at here, the important part is to understand the following. You know, the same way least squares is not used to combine four range measurements to get two positions. Least squares is used, and least squares methods are used to do things like to, compa to, com to blend 1,000 sensor measurements to make an estimate of 100 parameters. That's, that's the real thing. Um, so these are just little vignettes. This is called a compartmental model. So this, this whole book's written on models like this. They're, it's used in, well, obviously it's used in chemistry. It's actually used in economics with the flow of, to describe flow of materials and goods. It's used also in, uh, I guess, pharmacokinetics is, is where you see this used a lot, where you, you trace things moving from one place to another. Some of those models are not linear, uh, but linear ones are sort of the, the, the basic ones. What's nice about our abstraction is that, you know, if you look at the source code I wrote to, to simulate, you know, to draw this plot, um, it, pro it defines A and A is this thing, but it would just, the same code would work just as well if A were 1,000 by 1,000. Now, I promise you, if I give you a compartmental system with 1,000 species and different things leaking into other things and making multiple byproducts and things like that, what happens is not obvious at all. Same, same as least squares. At least, you know, if you have, give you four range measurements, anybody can kind of make a good guess as to what your position is. 
If I give you a thousand samples of a signal or you know, tomographic projections and ask you what the image is, there's no way. So same as here. I, I just mentioned that. OK. Um, next example is, a, uh, is actually a discrete time linear dynamical system. So a discrete time linear dynamical system, of course, that's just an iteration. It's just this. It's x of t is ax of t, right? Uh, for which, by the way, the solution I can write out right now. It's, it's no problem. I'll just write out the general solution. It's a to the t times x of 0. There. That, this, by the way, this formula even works because one convention is that a matrix to the 0th power is the identity. So this will even be valid for t equals 0, but it doesn't matter. Okay? So, so there's the full solution of that. Um, but let's look at an example. An example here is a, is a discrete time Markov chain. Uh, by the way, uh, you don't, I mean, probability is not a prerequisite for this course. So, but in any case, these are just examples. So these are just examples to show you that these things do come up. You, actually, you really should know it. I, I can't imagine not knowing about Markov chains. It would be a mistake in pretty much any field I can think of. But OK. So, so if, you, if, if, if you have the background to understand what I'm, this example, great. If you don't, don't sweat it. But maybe you can get the idea. So here's what happens. You have a, you have a random sequence, but the values in the sequence, uh, it's just a finite number of values. It can only be 1, 2, 3, up to n. Okay? And generally, these are called uh, states or something like that. Okay? And we'll look at an example um, shortly. Uh, but so the states could be things. This could either be states like a system is up, down, uh, it's in standby mode. It's also called modes of a system. This could, it could be in standby mode. Uh, something uh, you could have admission blocked in a network or something like that. This can also give a queue length. So this, could, th this state could be the number of jobs waiting to be processed. This could be the number of packets queued in a communication system to go out on some, on some outgoing link, for example. So that would be the type of place where you'd, you'd see this. Okay. Now what we're given is this. Um, if you know what z of t is, that's one of these numbers. It's one of these states or modes. You actually don't know what z of t plus 1 is. But you have a conditional probability. So here's what you know. You know that given that you're in state j at time t, the probability that you're in state i at the next step is given by some numbers p i j. Okay. Um, I should warn you here that people who do Markov chains use the transpose, and they use row vectors. Okay, so. What, what you see here is not what you'd see in this whole course is on Markov chains, but it, you will not, they'll use a different notation. Actually, it's just transpose. Everything is transpose. Probability vectors are row vectors, and the i and the j are switched. So for us, pij is the transition probability from state j to state i. Why? Well, because that's kind of, for us, if someone walks up to you and says y equals ax, and you say, what is aij? You say, well, that's the gain from input j to output i. So we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep our, our standard. Um, they do it the other way around. For them, pij is the transition probability from i to j. But this, this is just to warn you. OK. So this is a given matrix of, of transition probabilities. And that means, for example, that, the col that the, for us, not in probability, but for uh, in, in, or statistics, um, the, a column is a is, is a, the first column actually is going to be a probability vector. It, it's actually, it, it's, a, it's a bunch of numbers that add up to one, and it tells you if you're in state one, these are the probabilities of where you'll be at the next step. So for example, if it was this, right, if that was the first column of P, you would say, if you're in state one, then with 100% probability at the next step, you will be in state three. Okay? If it looked like this, 0.5 and 0.5 and zero, zeros and so on. This says, if you're in state 1 at time t, then at the next step, there's a 50% chance you'll still be in state 1, and a 50% chance you will move up to state 2. By the way, if, if the state represented some q length, it would be something like this. It would say that with 50% chance, um, the q length will, re will remain 1. And with a 50% chance, it'll, it'll go up to 2, which means maybe a new, a new packet or a new job arrived, for example. OK. So the way you analyze these is you, you represent a probability distribution of z of t as an n vector. 
um, as I said, in probability and statistics and in OR, uh, people represent these as row vectors. Uh, some. Some people also do this. So you make it a row, a row vector like this, and it, this is a, a vector that adds up to 1, um, and all the entries are positive. And it basically tells you the probability. Okay. Um, now, if you want to calculate something like the probability that something is 1, 2, or 3, you would simply, uh, that's a linear combination. It's simply the sum of the first three entries, and so you'd have a, a, a row vector here times your probability. Matrix, uh, times your probability vector. Okay. Now, if you simply work out what, if you write out what this is in matrix form, it is abs it's just nothing more than this. It basically says that the next probability distribution on states is capital P times the current probability distribution on states. So that's what it was. And so this is a, a discrete time linear dynamical system. So you'd say for a Markov chain, the probability distribution propagates according to a, a discrete time linear dynamical system. Now, the P here is often but not always sparse. Um, and a Markov chain is often depicted uh, graphically. And I'll give you an example. Um, I'll, sh here's just, I'll just jump to an example. So here's a, a baby, baby example. But here it is. I have three states. And let's say they even have, they even have uh, I, I've been, uh, we've added a, a meaning or, or a comment or, to each one. So state one is something like the system is working. State two is the system is down. And state three is the system being, is being repaired. This is the Markov chain. Now, of course, you could go through it and look at rows and columns and figure out exactly what, it, you know, what each one means. Uh, these zeros have various meanings, for example. That 0 0.9 has a, a, a meaning. But let's look up here. This is the way you would draw it. So you imagine a particle sort of sitting at one of these states. You flip a coin, actually a, a, a coin that has a 90% probability. Anyway, you, you, um, you flip a coin or, or whatever, you get a random variable that has a 90% chance of, uh, of coming up heads or whatever. So what this says is if you're in state one, which means if the system is OK, it is, there's a 90% chance that at the next step it will also be OK. There's a 10% chance that it will go into state two, which is the system down. Here, okay? If the system is down, there's a 70% chance that at the next step it will be up again and running. There's a 20% chance it will remain down. And there's a 20% chance it will um, it'll go into, it, there's a 20% chance it, you'll actually have to call in somebody and repair it or something like that. However, if it's repaired, this 1.0 says that the repairs are in, infallible. They always work. Okay? So this is, that's it. And this is a silly little, and this is even not so silly because there's some very interesting things you can do. You can take this linear dynamical system. And you can do all sorts of interesting things. You can run it for a long time to see what happens. Okay? Now, in general, of course, you don't know what's going to happen here. Does anyone have a rough idea of what, what would happen here if you, if you run this for a long time? You can just guess. Uh, by the way, if you, if you know about Markov chains, don't, don't answer. So I want someone who's just, just, just intuition. What hap Let me ask you this. If, if, I, if I run this like 10 steps, um, do you think you can tell me intelligently what the state was 10 steps ago? 100. Suppose it's been running 100 times. What would you say? Where, 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 what would you say about where, where, where do you think the state is? Well, let me just, let's just answer that question. We'll start it off in this state. So it started off in the state 100, zero, zero, and I run this 100 times. What do you think the probability distribution looks like? This, I, this is pure intuition. I just want intuition. But I claim you have the intuitions. Well, what do you think is the probability that you're in this state? I mean, but obviously, I don't want a number to four significant figures here. right? I want a number between 0 and 1. And in fact, all you have to do is say small, large, 0, 1. It's small. OK. So good, fine, it's small. And for this one? It's what? It's, uh, it's larger, but maybe, maybe uh, uh, but still relatively small. And for this one, it should be, I don't know. In fact, you want to guess some numbers? Go ahead and guess a number on that. What is it? Nine, 0.95? I don't, really? No, 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 because this basically says that one in 10 times it goes here. Okay. If it actually, if it always went back, if this was a 1.0 here, 
it would be 0.9 exactly, wouldn't it? Because 1 in 10 times it would be here. But the point is, sometimes it actually goes a couple of times here, and a couple of times it goes over here. So it's got to be less than 0.9, I think. Are you buying this? Yeah. So it's, I don't know what it is. I'll make up a number. It's 0.85. Or, hey, Jacob, um, do you want to calculate the steady state probability distribution on this guy? O only, if, only if your laptop is on. Is it? OK. We'll, 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 uh, yeah, don't worry. We'll take your time, and we'll come back to it. It's the, uh, le I guess in this case, it's not the leftist. It's the right eigenvector. So, OK. So all right, so what, ha what happens is you're gonna, you actually you'll, you'll be able to see, you'll be able to do this immediately. Uh, you'll, you'll, within two, three weeks, you'll be able to say very cool things like this. Someone can take a sy this system and say things like, by the way, when, something, when the system goes down, what's the average number of time periods it takes before it, before it comes back up again? And that has an, and that has an I mean, it's, it's some number. Well, we could, we, you, you maybe, you could, you could calculate. These are incredibly useful. You could ask, what fraction of the time is this machine up and running? That's very important. That will tell you your throughput or whatever. And if the machine costs $14 million, that's very important to know what the throughput is because, well, the throughput is going to be the, uh, that's going to be the denominator. Okay. All right. So this is the type of thing. Uh, by the way, once again, this is a baby problem. We can get it. If I put 10 states here, if I, put a, if I put a little queuing system with 10 states and maybe 50, 80 transition probabilities, I guarantee you, you have no idea what the, what, what, what the probabilities uh, are going to converge to and all that. What is it? And point what? Thank you. Great. There you go. So here it is. If you run this for a long time, not even a long time, probably 10, 15, 20 steps will do the trick. The probabilities will go to this. Okay? These are extremely important numbers in practice. They tell you that actually after a little while, this thing, 88% of the time, the system is up and running. 0.1% of the time, it's actually uh, down. And 0.02% of the time, what's that? Thank you. It's exactly 10%. What did I say? Oh, I said 0.1%. Oh, well, you know what I meant. When I say 0.1%, I mean 10%. Some, okay, sometimes, right. No, you know, look, come on. This is a, that's a graduate class. That's, that's, that's allowed. So that's fine. Undergraduate class, you have to distinguish between 0.1% and 10%. Not here. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, you can check. That's in the, that's in the official rules. Um, okay, so these are the numbers, and that's what it looks like. Okay. So I mean, you'll you'll be able to look at these. These are interesting things. So now we know the answer. Uh, the system is under repair. Uh, it's it's under repair two percent of the time. Now, by the way, you can estimate your repair bill. Um, yeah. By the way, you could do things like say, oh, I don't know. I can, maybe I can get I can upgrade to a fancier machine or whatever, and these probabilities change. Um, and you might someone can put a price tag on it and ask, how long would it take to pay for itself? Um, by the way, if that's like a, if, if it's infinity or a negative number, it probably means you shouldn't buy it or something like that. I guess not a negative number. If it's infinity, you shouldn't buy it. So, I mean, these would be the types of questions you should answer. So, you would, would be able to answer. Okay. All right. Next topic is, uh, or next example. These are just examples. Let's, let's look at a numerical method for calculating x dot equals ax. Hey, I was just involved in something like just this. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Okay. So you have x of zero. Is, we're gonna, we have x dot equals ax, x of zero equals x zero. By the way, within about a week, you're going to have the exact solution of this. I mean, exact means sort of in an analytical sense. Um, and you can, well, you'll be able to compute it and all that sort of stuff um, very, very soon. You'll be able to work out the solution of this. And you'll know a lot about it. But here's a method for, for uh, approximately solving x dot equals ax. And the idea is this, is you take a small time step, h, right? And the hope is that x, the state should not change much in h seconds. And this is the simplest possible way to approximate, this, to get an approximate solution of a differential equation is this. It's really simple. Basically, it says this. You're at x of t at time t. 
That's your current state. And someone says, where will you be h seconds in the future, where h is this small number? Well, a very good approximation is this. Where you will be is where you are plus where you're going, roughly, your speed, multiplied by the time increment h. Now, it, this is, of course, this is an approximation. It is not actually equal, uh, except in you know, certain special, very special cases, but it's not equal. The reason is the minute, the instant you move away from x of t, your velocity vector changes. And this sort of assumes instead uh, that your velocity vector is going to be the same for all h, h seconds or something like that. So this is that x of t plus h is about equal to x of t plus h x dot of t. That's a x of t. And so this is basically a plus h a, i plus h a. That's, I could say that too. So if I point to i and say a, you should interpret it as i. Unless what I've written is wrong, in which case you should interpret it as a. So that's clear, isn't it? Good. OK. So x t plus h is i plus h a x of t. Um, and this, if you, oh well, if we change the indexing, right, this gives you a, a discrete time uh, linear dynamical system. And it, and it means you can, uh, you can actually work out an approximate solution. That's an approximate solution. That, that, that's what it looks like. Um, so that's the, that's the idea. That's x of kh. Uh, by the way, we can, we can actually have some, uh, well, no, I, I, won't, I won't do it. I'll, 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 keep with, I'll, I'll, I'll keep with this thing for now. So, now actually this method is never used in practice because, uh, for a couple of reasons. The first is this, you, when, you're, when you're doing this, you sort of, you start at one place, you make an approximation as to where you'll be next step. Now, you make an approximation based on that approximation and so on and so forth. And although this can actually work, um, it, it, the error can and does build up in, in lots of systems. Actually, you'll later be able to do a perfect analysis of when the error, what types of system the error would build up and also where it doesn't. And there are also much better methods, but this is just the simplest method. Okay. So those are just a bunch of examples just to show you that these things do, in fact, come up. So let's look at, um, uh, oh, let's get one thing out of the way. Um, we are looking at x dot equals ax. That's a first order vector linear differential equation. It's nothing more. Depending on how you count it, it's, uh, let's see, it's one, two, three, four, five. It's five ASCII characters, or I don't know, however you want to count that. Very compact. But what about second order and third order and fourth order and all those sorts of things? By the way, second order systems come up constantly in mechanics and dynamics. Basically, everything is second order. Okay? Lots of other systems, lots of things are second order. Okay? Actually, for discrete time systems, you have the same thing. A lot of things. Your next state depends not just on your current, no, sorry, your, your next value, I shouldn't call it the state. The next value of something depends not just on the current value, but actually on the previous one as well. So that would be um, a higher order uh, recursion. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, this is a x differentiated k time, so this is a, a kth order linear uh, dynamical system like that. Lucky for you, we can reduce these to first order. Uh, otherwise, there'd have to be another class after this one on this. This would just be first order one, then you have second and third, and it'd get very boring anyway. So here it is. There's a, there's a standard trick. Oh, by the way, this doesn't work in the scalar case. So this is actually an, a payoff of taking the abstraction of matrices. So when, when you're an undergraduate and study that, hopefully for not too long, um, there's, and then someone comes along and says, yeah, but you know, I have to, I have to satisfy this, you know, this equation or something like that. Uh, unfortunately, you've got to dig in and solve this separately or something like that. Because right? there's no way you can reduce this to that because these are scalars. Now, the cool part is once you have passed that boundary and, and, become, and, and grown in sophistication and overloaded this equation so that, that these are vectors and A is a matrix, then it turns out you don't have to worry about higher order stuff ever again because it, it comes for free in this higher level of abstraction. So, it's a very standard method. It works like this. We're going to take the new variable. We're going to stack the derivatives here. So we stack x uh, of, of, of what, by the way, you cannot call x the state here. Um, so I might accidentally say it, but if I do, it's wrong. So you take the variable, the vector variable x, and you stack x, its derivative, second derivative, all the way up to 
the penultimate derivative. So that's this guy here, the k minus 1 derivative. And now I want to work out what is z dot. I'm going to call that z. And that's the state of the system. So I take z dot. Well, if I differentiate all of these, that's easy. The first one differentiated is just x dot. But that means that's the second block of elements in the vector. All the way down to the bottom one, and when I differentiate this bottom one, I get x differentiated k times, and now I use my formula here. So if you look at this matrix, you will see that it faithfully reproduces uh, this thing here. Um, this first row, for example, says that x1, uh, no, sorry, it says that x dot, that's x differentiated one time, is equal to, you're going to multiply this by over here, by x, x dot, x dot dot, and so on. It, you just go across here and down here. This is, these are block multiplication. And it's just x dot, so it's, it's correct. And the bottom one tells you what x differentiated k times is. That's this thing. Okay? By the way, you're going to see matrices like this coming up a lot. Um, you should already have some ideas about what this matrix is. This is called a block companion matrix. You don't need to know this. But its, it's pattern, you should already have an, a feel for what it does. And let me ask you this, just for fun, let's just make sure. If I showed you a matrix that looks like this, um, yeah, that's good. There we go. OK? And I asked you, everything I haven't shown is 0, OK? Um, tell me what it does. Just describe it. If I said, if, if we looked at this, can you please explain to me what y is as a function? And just in words, what does it do? It's a, it's a, it's an up, is it an upshift? Uh, is it, or is it a down, it's a, no, it's an upshift. Sorry, you take the vector x like this and you simply shift it up. And what do you do at the bottom? Yeah, okay, so here's how you'd say the slang for this on the streets is you upshift x and you zero pad. So upshift is kind of obvious. Uh, the zero pad means that when you go up, you're, you have some spaces where there was nothing. You can't, well, unless you're the kind of person who likes indexing out of, uh, out of bounds of arrays, which we frown on. Um, and and uh, here, you don't do that. Um, so you zero pad. That says what to do when, you, when your formula for shifting uh, indexes outside the array bounds. Everybody see what I'm saying? So it basically, I, I shouldn't even, I mean, you should, when you see that matrix, you should say, that's an upshift and zero pad. Actually, when I fill this in with a bunch of matrices here, it's actually really cool. It's actually an upshift, an upshift, and then down here, you pad with a linear combination of all the things. Or fill in. It's not, I, I guess padding is usually used with zero padding. OK. Yeah? Um, why would this work if the matrices are work? Why? Oh, it would work. I, I, I'll show you. Yeah, no problem. So no, it, it does work. And that's why I think the whole thing is silly. So let's go back to that and say, I, I really want to solve uh, this uh, like that. OK? So we can write this out this way. It's no problem. We write it this way. That's, that's the state. Dot equals. And then this is easy. That's 0, 1. And then let's see if I can get this right. Maybe that's uh, b and a times x, x dot. Did I do it right? Bear in mind, this reflects on you collectively as a class. If I write something down, it's like totally and completely wrong. And you just passively sit there and go, yeah, sure. Because basically, I don't care. So it I, doesn't bother me. I don't mind. Um, but it, it, will, it re will reflect on you if, if I say something really stupid and wrong and you don't cor collect, uh, correct it. So. Actually, I once yelled at a class, uh, well, by email. Um, after it was over, because it turns out those class email lists, they persist. Um, because I found some horrible error in a homework problem or something like that, or, what, or in a lecture. And I, I collectively held the class response. Well, I got some responses, actually. I said, you know, you took this class last year. This was completely wrong. And you, I remember seeing that. And I remember all of you looking at me like, yeah, yeah, oh, it's totally clear. <laughs> and then I got various responses for that. But what's that? What's not right? Um, here? Down here? Good. OK. This is x dot. Let, 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 let's do it together, and, and we'll see. But no, no. You think it's OK, great. No, no, that, this is what I want. 
Oh, and yeah, it's, it's, the dot is the whole thing. Here, watch. There we go. There we go. Hey, no, this, listen, this is what we want. That's what we want, see? That's, uh, that, that's good. In fact, better, I mean, for your collective, uh, I mean, what you really want is you want that, it, 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 is you want to raise some things and say, oh, I, is that right? And then you want me to go on and give a long, and say, oh, yeah, well, at first it looks like this should be a minus. But in fact, it should be a plus. I should give a story about it and everything. And then it can turn out wrong. Then I'm the one who looks bad, not you. Then, then, but your, your honor is preserved then because you protested. So, okay. So, no, good. So let's keep me honest. All right. Back to the question. Why can't we do this? Well, we can do it. It's fine. Here's the problem is that uh, when you first learned about this, no one had told you about matrices yet. Or at least that was the case. So that, that's, that's the problem. It's basically why people should be taught linear algebra a lot earlier than they are now. Because it just short circuits a lot of really stupid and painful and idiotic uh, material. Um, such as, for example, you know, multiple, multiple weeks studying second order equations. So, but I'll stop. OK. So a block diagram, by the way, when you see x dot, you know, well, sorry, z dot equals a z. And a was big, or z dot equals big A z. And it's got, that, that is like structure crying out at you. Um, you should have an overwhelming, uncontrollable urge to draw a block diagram. So here's the block diagram. It's this. And you can check that this is right. Um, this, by the way, this shift business, uh, you can see immediately here. Um, because actually when, you sh when, you, when, when we're actually calculating a z and we're shifting z, we're actually getting the derivative. So that's right, that corresponds exactly. By the way, people, there's a, there's a phrase for this, it's called a chain of integrators. So you'll, you'll find that very, uh, very frequently, it comes up in lots of things. And it's quite beautiful, it says something like this. It says, by the way, the arrows, if you, can, if you can look here, you'll see that all the arrows go down. So you'll see that in fact, that's just a chain of integrators. They don't do, the, each, each of these things simply, uh, so in fact, you can even say if that's xk, if that's the input signal, this is it integrated once, that's double integrated, triple integrated, and so on. That's what these are. Okay, it says take these things which are integrated, form a linear combination, and feed that back into the input. So that's what this picture is. So, I mean, not that this matters, but although this should maybe look like, if these were z minus ones, this might look like some horrible filter you might have encountered in some stupid class on signal processing, right? No? Yes? Do they, I don't know, hopefully, do, do, are, you, are you still tortured with these things? And th this has some stupid, what, what name, do, what do they call this? It's like an IIR direct form blah, blah, blah. Is that it? Okay, it, it's what? No, 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 no. That, that would be FIR. Oh, sorry. If I did this and then pulled this off, that would be FIR. But with this guy here, that's an IIR. By the way, if, if some of you don't know what we're talking about, you're very lucky. Okay. <laughs> All right. And you should aim to keep it that way. So. All right. Mechanical systems. Well, that, that is a huge uh, number of, I and mean, this is a perfect example of a higher order system. So mechanical systems. Um, so a lot of mechanical systems. Again, by the way, this is a beautiful example where once you have matrix notation, a lot of stuff works out very, very cleanly and beautifully. You have M. So Q is a vector of generalized displacements in, in, some, uh, in some system. And that means basically a displacement in a, in a, in a certain direct, each Q3, for example, <coughs> might be the horizontal displacement of some point on a system. Um, but it could also be like an angular displacement or something like that. Um, so you get M, Q double dot, that's the acceler this is the acceleration vector. M is like the mass vector, uh, plus D, Q dot, that's a, a damping uh, matrix here, plus K, Q. And by the way, this is nothing more than, here, I'll draw it. It's, it's the matrix analog of this. So there's a spring with a stiffness constant K, a mass here uh, of, with, with mass M. And then, of course, we have the famous uh, dash pot. This is one of my favorite uh, things. It's, uh, it's, it's damping, but it's drawn like that, I guess. And it has been since the early, like, 19th century. So, anyway. well, I don't know, maybe, has, have people seen this, like a figure like this? If you're, you have. You ever actually, I mean, except for maybe a shock absorber in a car, have you ever, I mean, so you don't see these. 
it's sort of uh, they actually they look like this because they act in you know in, in the early 19th century when they built all these machines and things like that actually even earlier uh, they actually added damping and they would act they would be things like this they would have a little, a little piston a little nozzle and some oil or something like that would be circulating and it looked just like that and it's called a dash pot don't ask me why but that's the that's the history of it so there it is and that's deep and what this says is this is you know this is basically ma that's the force and the force is equal to minus dq dot minus kq now k uh, we'll go back to this one is simply the displacement so the the units of k would be in newtons per meter so it's a stiffness and and d is in newtons per meter per second okay or newtons per left paren meters per second right paren right that that's what the units of, of dr and mass is uh, kilograms, say. Okay, now what, what's actually kind of cool about this is it's the same thing. This is sort of the, there, there's your high school version here. Um, and all you do is you capitalize things and everything, and you, this, this describes a lot. I mean, a whole lot. So same number of ASCII characters as you saw this thing in uh, some physics class for children, okay? This thing describes a whole lot. I mean, like, this, these could be hundreds, in fact, typically are hundreds or thousands of, of uh, the dimension of Q can be thousands. And then this would be, for example, a model of a bridge, for example, undergoing small motions or a building or something like that. So, and that would be described by this. So M is called the mass matrix, K is the stiffness matrix, D is the damping matrix. And you do the same, this uh, so-called phase variable trick that we just did. And you take a state is x is q and q dot. So, and you get, so you get a, a positions and velocities. And you have x dot is q dot and q double dot. But q double dot, I can get from here with, uh, by putting m inverse through here, and I get this. And I think this is maybe on homework one or something anyway. Except you didn't know about it then. So, uh, so there's some actually rather interesting things here. And just for fun, I would like you to explain to me what is the meaning of k12? The units? Newtons per meter. And I want you to tell me, what is K12 in a mechanical system? What is it? Oh, it has a very specific physical meaning. Want to help us? No, no, oh, you got it. That is it exactly. It's something like a cross stiffness, or there's probably some name for it, like a trans stiffness or something. I mean, I know what you'd call it in circuits, but I don't know what you call it mechanically. But something like a trans stiffness. It says, basically, it's the force. It, this tells you, the, it says that when you, when you displace the thing, a uh, node 2 in some structure, you feel a force at node 1. And it's proportional to this. So this is, this is the trans stiffness. It's the number of newtons of force you feel at node one when node two moves one meter. That's what it is. Whereas in general, K11, for example, is, is basically what you think of as a stiffness. It's basically if you grab node one, push it a meter, that might, be the, not, might not be the right unit. But nevertheless, I guess you can grab the top of a building and push it a meter, a big, big tall building. But you grab, it, you grab it and you move it a meter and it pushes back with some number of newtons. That's K11. Okay, so let's look at, uh, we should also mention uh, l linearization. This as a general source of autonomous linear dynamical systems. So some systems actually really are, uh, really look like, like actually have the modeling of x dot equals x is actually pretty good. There, there are a number of cases where that's true. There's a bunch of others where it's less true. So let's, in general, you get things that look like this. X dot is f of x. That's an autonomous uh, time invariant differential equation. And this, could, this, this comes up all the time. This could describe an economy that's propagating. It could describe the dynamics of a vehicle or something like that or so, anything else. 
that's it, or a circuit. This would, this would describe, essentially all circuits would have a description like that. And here, f is simply a function from Rn to Rn. And in fact, the meaning of f is simple. It basically maps where you are to where you're going. It's a vector field. OK. Now, an equilibrium point of a general, of a general time invariant differential equation is simply a point in state space where f is 0. And what that means is interesting. It says, if you're at one of these points, your derivative is 0. And that means you're, you stay there. So it says that the constant solution, xe, satisfies the differential equation because xe dot is 0. xe is a constant. And on the right-hand side, you plug in f of xe, that's 0, 2. So, so an equilibrium point corresponds to, corresponds to a constant solution of a differential equation. That's an equilibrium point. Now suppose you're near an equilibrium point, but not exactly at it. Then you write x dot. Well, that's f of x. But you're near this equilibrium point, so we'll use a first order Taylor expansion. By the way, to connect to a discussion we had last week, uh, it would, you'd probably do better if you knew the approximate range of x wiggling around. You might, instead of using this matrix, use one that you got from sort of a particle filter method, which would be to say to at, do a bunch of evaluate a bunch of points and then fit a least squares model. But let's let's just move on. So we'll just take the derivative, the Jacobian here. And this says that your f is about equal to the f where you are plus the, the Jacobian where you are multiplied by the deviation from where you are, like that. Okay? Now we'll put this this um, this is zero right here, like that. Um, this is x dot, but I could just as well uh, write this I can subtract if I like x dot uh, minus x equilibrium dot because x equilibrium dot is zero so I can do that very a traditional term for that is delta x that's by the way to be interpreted as a single token the question I didn't say that what that was true, so I. But but it, it it it's true. What I said was true, this time, um, really. So, uh, what I said was, if if you if you start at an equilibrium point, you will stay there. Period. That is a true statement. You're getting on to our next topic. Um, the question the, the the question you're asking is is exactly what we're we're going to start looking at very soon is what happens if you're not exactly at the equilibrium? What if you're a little bit off? And there's actually, roughly speaking, two dramatic things that could happen. Actually, there's three, qualitatively. Um, one is that you, if you're a little bit off, you could actually sort of start moving back towards the equilibrium point. That would be stability. Another one is that if you're a little bit off, you actually start veering away the wrong direction. You move farther away. That, that would be an unstable equilibrium point. And then there's weird stuff in the middle, like, for example, it could just sit there happily and stay there. That, that's stability. Now, what you would say then is, is, had I not made a mathematical statement, but had I made a practical statement, now, in general, you don't see, you, you will not see if I have a mechanical system in front of me here or something like that, you, you won't actually physically observe a system in an unstable, sitting in an unstable equilibrium. Um, it's for obvious reasons. Because the formula, the actual the derivative, it's not really this, it's this, right? Plus something like, um, W of t, where W of t is tiny little noises acting on it. Um, it doesn't matter what they are. They could be even just from thermal noise or mi minor things. If it's an unstable equilibrium and there's a little bit of extra noise here, you, that you, you, you move off immediately. Once you're off, you start <coughs> diverging and you don't stay there. So that was a very long and weird answer. But I, I, I go back and I say that I, what I said was correct. If you stay in an start an equilibrium position, you stay there. Okay. Now, um, now we're going to talk about what happens if you start very near an equilibrium position. Let's see what happens. Equilibrium point. So here, delta x is this deviation. And you can write it this way. Delta x dot is df. That's the Jacobian times that. And that's a, that, that is exactly what we have been calling an autonomous linear dynamical system. Right? So, by the way, a lot of people get bored with the deltas and they drop it. So, for example, if you ask somebody who's studying uh, aircraft dynamics, uh, they'll just say, here's the system. And they'll say, you'll say, well, what's x? And they go, oh, that's the, 
That's the roll angle, that's the roll rate, that's the angle of attack, the angle of attack rate, and all that kind of stuff. And you'll say, really? These, and they'll say, well, no, no, it's the, these are the deviations around level flight of a 747 at 40,000 feet and 580 miles an hour, something like that. That, that would be what they, so a lot of people just drop these. Um, I guess in electrical engineering, what do you call these little delta X's? What, what are the delta X's? It's called small signal, right? What do you call an equilibrium point? Bias. So you call it a bias, I think, right? Is there any, do they call it an equilibrium point ever? I don't think so, no. I think you have a, like you have a little transistor circuit and you figure out, uh, oh, they call it the DC something? DC operating point, that's, that's a really old one. That's there. So you can call it DC operating point or bias condition. And, oh, and let's see, what do you, and what do you call it narrow astro? I know there's people in here who are in that department. Isn't it called like the trim condition? I think it's called the trim condition. But anyway, you can, someone will correct me if I'm wrong. So you'd be, so, I mean, all sorts of fields have their own names for an equilibrium point and things like that, but it's just an equilibrium point. That's, that's sort of the, the, high, the, the, the high language to describe this as an equilibrium point. These other ones are all just dialects. Okay. So, um, when you approximate a differential, when you approximate the right-hand side of a differential equation, this is like forward Euler approximation. Um, it's very, if you just approximate a function, you can say intelligent things about it like, well, you know, if you don't, if the, if you, if delta x is smaller than such and such a thing, your error is no more than 3%. You can make specific claims. When you approximate the right-hand side of a differential equation, you might be in trouble. Because in a, when you approximate the right-hand side of a differential equation, you're really sort of, uh, I mean, when you look at the trajectory, you're really building approximations on approximations. Because you're really saying, where am I going right now? And they go, well, you're going about in that direction. That's, that's what df of xe times delta x is. And then you go, great. So you step over here and you say, where am I going now? And they go, well, you're going about in that direction. So the point is you're building up, up you're building up, up approximations on approximations on approximations. And so you might be lucky and you might not be. So, so the best verb uh, to describe how delta x dot equals df of xe delta x in what way that approximates the actual trajectories, the best verb would be hope. So that, and that's, which actually expresses it later. And we'll talk about that uh, a bit, actually a bit later today. Okay. So let's look at an example. Is a pendulum. So we have a pendulum here. And the angle, uh, it's, it's, hang, it, it's, at, it's at an angle of theta. And that's going to put a torque on it of minus LMG sine theta. So that's the, that's the torque. G is whatever, 9.8 meters per second squared or whatever, gravitational acceleration. And that's the uh, rotational inertia. So this is basically uh, rotational inertia times the angular acceleration is equal to the torque on it. And the minus is, is, means it's a restoring torque. So it means that if you're, if you're this way, that appears to be how I drew theta positive, it says that the torque actually acts, tw it twists this, you can't see that, it twists that way. So that's a, that's a restoring torque here. Now we can write that as a first order differential equation, nonlinear. This way it's x dot is x2, x, x1 dot is x2, x2 dot is minus g, g over L sine x1. So it looks like that. Okay? Now, the first thing you do when you see something like this is you need to, you need to do, the first thing you do is you analyze the equilibrium points. I mean, unless it's obvious, unless someone gives it to you and says, we're interested around this point. But here, so let's figure out what the equilibrium points are. Equilibrium point says that this, this is f of x here. And the question is, when does that vanish? Well, if this vanishes, x2 is 0. By the way, x2 is the angular acceleration. So that says at an equilibrium point, you're not moving. The pendulum's not moving. The second was says g over l sine x1 is 0. That means that x1 is a multiple of pi. And so that means, in fact, there's an infinite number of equilibrium positions. Okay, so if you could have zero, and that's actually pendulum down, that's like this, like that. Um, you can have pi, and that's, uh, that's pendulum up. You can also have two pi, but that's basically the same as pendulum down again. So it's kind of silly, but it's an equilibrium position. Okay, 
Now, actually, we're going to get to your question of like stability and things like that. You probably have a very good idea of how that of, of how this works. If a pendulum is hanging down, and you uh, poke it a little bit and let go, it'll just oscillate. There's no damping in this, so it'll just oscillate forever. On the other hand, what happens if you put a pendulum straight up, and then maybe just give it a just knock it a little bit? What will happen with no damping? I want you to integrate that differential equation by intuition. So anyway, you know what happens. What happens? What? Well, it goes down here. It has a high velocity at the bottom. In fact, at the bottom, its potential energy is, is as l low as it can get. So it's kinetic energy. All of the potential energy up here has now been converted to kinetic. And it's moving fast. And then it goes all the way up to the other side. And then uh, it depends how I hit it and all that kind of stuff. But if I, if I hit it at a velocity like that, it will arrive with just enough to keep going and do it again. And it'll just oscillate like that. Right? Had I done something like released it stationary one degree at 89 degrees from 89 degrees, so, well, from vertical, from horizontal, um, what would have happened is it would have gone like this, it would have gone all the way around, slowed way, way, way down, got to one degree the other direction, stopped for an instant, and then gone back. And it would, it would just keep making a long oscillation like that. So that's what would happen. OK. Um, so let's look at the, at the um, linearized approximation near these two uh, equilibrium points. Um, if, you, if you linearize it near equilibrium point, all I have to do is go back over here and take the Jacobian of this. So I take the partial derivative of this first row with respect to x1, that's 0. The partial derivative with respect to x2, that's 1 here. And I fill in this matrix. And at the bottom, I take the partial derivative of this thing with respect to x1. That turns this into a cosine. And I plug in x1 equals 0, and I get minus g over l over here, like that. And then the partial derivative with respect to x2, that's 0. And I get this. Now, actually, you'll know soon enough that this, in fact, defines an oscillation. And this one would be a pretty good approximation of what actually happens. By the way, let's calculate the linearized system near xe equals pi. So let's do the pendulum up. In this case, delta x is, nothing happens up here. It's the same. That's a 0. And what will happen here is I take the derivative again. It's cosine, but I plug in pi now. And I'm going to get the following. I'm going to get plus g over l. And that's it. That's the difference between, between the two linearized versions of a pendulum in up and down position. Now, actually, this is kind of interesting because this one corresponds to a restoring torque. That's what this is, if you just simply work out what it means. It means that the second derivative is, is, is proportional to your displacement, but with a negative sign. So if you're displaced two degrees, you know, however you displace, the torque is a restoring torque. You see that? That is not a restoring torque. It's a, oh. How do you say that in English? What's the opposite of a restoring torque? That is a not restoring torque. That's what this is. It's a not restoring torque, meaning that once, if you move off, it's like, oh, no problem. It puts a torque on it, but it puts a torque that exacerbates your deviation. Okay? And so you'd actually see it kind of, kind of all makes sense. This, this predicts exactly what you pointed out. What happens if, you, if you're near there? It tells you if you're in the bottom, if you're, in the, if you're in this mode and you, you different, and you move a little bit, it's actually going to have a restoring torque on it. Up here, you're going to have actually a torque that pushes you away. OK. So this brings, the, brings up the question, which we will uh, look at later, I think. Actually, I can't, no, I can't remember, but OK. Might be in a different class. Um, does linearization work? And the basic answer is yes, but with some, there's some footnotes, and there is some, uh, there's, there's some legal, um, there, you, ha you have to kind of sign a release when you do a linearization. So there, you, there's some conditions. So here it is. Uh, the, the answer is, is this. A linearized system usually but not always gives a good idea of the system behavior near an equilibrium point. And to give an example where it fails, here's one. Let's take x dot equals minus x cubed. Well. It's a scalar differential equation. Uh, by the way, that's, that's sort of a restoring. It, it's restoring. If, if x is positive, it says your derivative 
it is negative. It pushes you down. But it's quite interesting what this looks like. And forget the solution, which this is one of the 13 differential equations you can actually solve analytically. That's not relevant. It's much more important to understand what this says. So x dot equals minus x cubed says this. If x is big and positive, what is x dot? If x is big and positive. OK, really big and negative. Uh, I like your answer very, very much, except for one thing. Let's be a little bit more precise about it. Ready? Instead of really big, I would say it's really, really big and negative. You know why that? Because it was big cubed. So big is big. Really big is big squared. And really, really big is. So I, your answer was right. But, but I, I, a slightly more correct answer would be if x is big and positive, what is x dot? The answer is really, really big and negative. So it means if you're big, you are shooting towards the origin very quickly. What happens if x is one? You will, as you approach the origin, right? So x gets small. What is x dot? What is it? Thank you. If x is small and positive, x dot is really, really small. So we can already predict what this differential equation does. Compared to x dot equals minus x, which gives you a solution which is e to the minus x, we can say this thing, when x is big, this, this gets smaller way faster than an exponential. It shoots towards the origin. When as x sort of passes through 1, once x gets small, this thing decays way slower than an exponential. OK? So we got the qualitative behavior very simple way. Um, if x is negative, it repeats. But you're, the point is you're always moving towards the right place. OK, and indeed, the solution looks like this. It grows, it falls like uh, what, you know, 1 over a, a square root or something like that, 1 over square root t, which is very slow. OK, now let's flip the sign and, and study z dot uh, equals z cubed. Now here, uh, what happens is it's the same story, except if you're big, your velocity, your, your actually derivative is positive, and it's really, really big. So once you're big, you're, you start accelerating upward. Um, sorry. You really, really accelerate upwards. Okay, so this one is actually going to be sort of wildly. It, you can predict just by looking at it, it's going to be wildly unstable. Okay, actually, this is so unstable it, it has a phenomenon called a finite escape time. Um, what actually happens is the solution goes like this. It actually goes like this, and actually at a finite time, it just goes to infinity. Okay, so which is a fairly dramatic form of instability. Which we, by the way, haven't formally defined. We will later, but that's OK. Now, now we know how the system really behaves. Let's look at the linearization. If you linearize x dot equals minus x cubed near 0, here's what you get. You get delta x dot equals 0. Why? Because you say, what is, you say, what's f of x when x is near 0? And the answer is it's really, really small. But someone says, yeah, to first order, what is it? Really, really small is 0. So it's this. So it basically says the linearization would predict that x is sort of constant, actually for this one and for this one. So in a sense, neither is right. Um, actually, uh, there, neither of these, n neither linearization predicts the correct long-term behavior. But actually, if we were to zoom way in on this, way down here, you'd actually see that both of them are correct in the following sense. For Short times, they both give excellent predictions. Because actually, both the wildly unstable and the stable system, once, when x is small, they, in fact, both are moving really, really slow. I said it right. Really, really slow near the origin. One is moving really, really slow and increasing. And that's the one that, at some point, is going to is gonna, is gonna get big and then go through a finite escape time. The other one is moving really, really slow towards the origin, and it's just going to keep going and very slowly move to the origin. OK. So um, however, most of the time, it, it makes uh, good predictions. Actually, later, we'll find out exactly when uh, linearization makes a good prediction. So. OK. Another version of this is linearization uh, along a trajectory. So linearization along a trajectory. So something like this, uh, linearization around an equilibrium point, this would come up if you're designing a circuit. 
if you are uh, looking at something like a ve vehicle stability or something, or vehicle dynamics, you want to find out how does a vehicle do. Um, what happens if there's a wind burst under an airplane or a wind shear or something like that? It's off a little bit. Uh, by the way, it would also come up in, uh, in, in, in bigger things like a, a, a something like a big queuing system or something like that. So you'd say you'd have a big, a big network and you could say, what have I, or a big, just take a big network and you'd say, what happens if all of a sudden uh, 10,000 packets arrived at that node destined for this one? I mean, that's supposed to be a small number, right, compared to, but whatever. It would, so you, would act, you could actually work out the changes in the queues and everything. It would be just linearization would work quite well. So, okay. But now we're going to talk about linearization around a trajectory. So linearization around a trajectory goes like this. I have a trajectory, and now I'm actually going to consider a time-varying uh, differential equation here. So I have, I have x dot equals f of x and t, and I have a trajectory. Uh, I have something that actually satisfies that differential equation. So this could be, for example, the give you the dynamics of a rocket or something like that. Doesn't matter. Something like that. Okay? So that's what it does. Now, suppose, and in fact, this could be here um, some sort of propo I proposed trajectory. I doesn't matter. Some, some calculated trajectory. And what you want is you want to take another trajectory which is near the original one. I want to be vague about what that means. It means basically at all times you're never too far away. And we want to work out what happens now. So here you have ddt of the, of the difference, that's x minus x trajectory, that's f of x t minus f of x trajectory t. And that's about equal to the, deri the Jacobian of f, or the derivative of f with respect to x of this times x minus x trajectory. And this gives you a time-varying linear dynamical system. It looks like that. And that's called the linearized or variational system along a trajectory. And this is used constantly, always, um, constantly used to, for example, evaluate uh, trajectories. Here you have an idea like stability for an equilibrium point. So you would ask, you'd say, I just calculated a trajectory for a vehicle. And you'd say, then you'd ask a question like this, what if you just sort of get slightly off? What if there's a little wind gust and you're slightly off? What will happen? And the question is, is the trajectory you want, like this, and then the thing's been blown off, and so now it's small. And the question is, will the, will the trajectories diverge? Uh, that would be one possible behavior. If, if they diverge, by how much will they diverge before this goes where it's supposed to go? Or will, for example, the trajectories converge? For example, that would be something like a stability, and we'll see things like that. So here's just a, a, a classic example is a linearized oscillator. So an oscillator is a differential system, a differential equation, a nonlinear dynamical system, uh, which has a t-periodic solution. So that's, a, uh, that, that's an oscillator with frequency 1 over, one over t. And there's a solution which is t-periodic, like this. Well, the linearized system is delta x is a of t delta x. And a of t here is actually periodic because you, it's, the, it's the Jacobian of this thing plugged in along the trajectory. Um, by the way, there's a whole, there's a whole name for, I mean, there's a whole field for studying uh, perturbations of periodic systems. It comes up all the time. Uh, it's called Floquet theory. You don't have to know this. This is just for fun. It's called Floquet theory. Um, so here, a of t is t periodic, and, and so you have a, a t periodic linear system. And you would use this to study all sorts of things. Uh, and I'll give you an example. The, the ones that's um, actually quite important would be in circuits. So you might design, for example, an oscillator. It could be an LC oscillator, or it could be a ring oscillator, or something like that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it, it really doesn't matter uh, for, this, for the purpose of this example. You might build a ring oscillator or something like that. And then you'd, be, you'd ask a question like this. You'd say, what if, what happens in this thing if there's like thermal noise? Or, or what if uh, some other circuit on the chip draws a lot of power and the voltage, su the supply voltage to the oscillator drops 30 millivolts, for example? That actually is going is, is to give you, it's going to knock you off this trajectory. And now the trajectory, let's imagine the trajectory sort of looks like this, right? You're going around like that. You get knocked off, and one of two things happen. 
Well, several things could happen. You might, you might converge back in to this trajectory, or you might go, you might diverge. If you diverge, it's what we call a bad, it's a non-functional oscillator, right? Although you could ask interesting questions like this. How big a, per, how big a hit can you take here and actually reconverge to, the, to this solution? Okay? Actually, generally speaking, real oscillators will, will recapture from a huge range. Um, but you can ask all sorts of cool questions, like when you, when, as you go back here, um, when you come back, you've actually, the, the time it took you to go around changed a little bit. That's called timing jitter. And so you might ask, how much does a 30 millivolt step in VDD change, affect the timing jitter? And in fact, that would be exactly analyzed by a linear dynamical system like this. But by the way, is there anyone who knows what I'm talking about? Because if not, I'll just stop talking about the, these things. That's, no, for, the, for those of you that watching this on TV, that's like, no. OK, fine. So you don't care about, you don't care about circuits, right? I, well, no. There we got an actual explicit. There we got a response, which is people shaking their heads, no. OK, fine. No problem. I'm, I, I'm not wedded to them either. OK, so this finishes up this. Maybe this is a good time uh, to quit. If anybody has any last questions about the midterm, I'll take that as a no. Um, so have fun. We'll, we'll see you tomorrow. Or we'll see some of you tomorrow.